Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, COVID is not the only virus that's dominating our country and our news at the moment. There's a new one in town. It's called Moralitis. It is, in fact, the title of a new book, Moralitis, a Cultural Virus, which aims to explain why wokeism and why political correctness and indeed why hard left ideology appears to have taken such root and is dominating all of our discourse at the moment. Now, we're going to be looking at the roots of this virus and indeed how we can possibly eradicate it. With me to discuss this, I have Robert Olds, who is director of the Bruges Group, and he is one of the authors. His co-author is Dr. Neil McRae. Mark Sidwell, who wrote the New Culture Forum publication, The Long March, and Rafe Hadelman Koo of the New Culture Forum historian and commentator. This is a very arresting title. So I wonder if it is a virus, where did it originate? Presumably not in Wuhan. Well, you can argue that the virus came from uh, the French sort of left bank, but really it began with the Frankfurt School in the 1920s, even before the First World War. They put this out there as a way of trying to win the culture war as a way of creating a communist revolution or a socialist revolution to overthrow the old order. And Hemingway himself said that first things happen gradually, then they happen suddenly. This has been out there, it's been in operation, it's been gradually infecting people, it's been fermenting, it's, the virus has been mutating and getting more and more virile and driving more and more people into a state of uh, a mental malady that, uh, that's really now beginning to have a massive impact on our society. And we see this in the United States at the moment. We see it in, in the United Kingdom with Extinction Rebellion and the acceptance almost in some quarters of political violence, uh, terrorism even, to, which is another which is the, the official term for, t for political violence. We see it in the United States where Black Lives Matter are running amok, which they all have a political agenda. And that agenda is the overthrow of things which we hold dear, such as capitalism, free markets, free enterprise, representative government and democracy, the rule of law. They want to smash these things as well as our loyalty to institutions and beliefs such as the faith, family and the flag. And they think that out of this chaos, there will be some better society that will come out of it. That's really the agenda that was put out there originally when Movilitis, the virus that we've identified, was put into our society and is now creating havoc. When you, uh, Neil, when you say uh, mor moralitis, why moralitis? You know, why, why are you calling it that? Well, in the book, we describe the, this long process that Roberts just mentioned, going back to the um, critical theorists of the Frankfurt School. Basically, they introduced cultural Marxism. They re realized that the, the de civil democracies of Western Europe wouldn't be persuaded by overt revolutionary uh, rhetoric. So they needed to be persuaded in other ways. And that nothing really changes unless the culture changes. So what we had was this, uh, the beginnings of cultural Marxism in the 1920s. But this is a stake that has kind of slivered through stealth through Western society. And if, if you talk to what we call woke younger people now, uh, they wouldn't call themselves Marxist. Um, so this is, in fact, success of cultural Marxism. It's managed to work. It's managed to weave its way into the fabric of our society without being named as such. And um, so cultural Marxism is something which is which is obviously very, very destructive, but it's a Marxist wolf in very fluffy sheep's clothing. Like now, COVID, most people don't know they're infected. Yes, yeah, so if, if you look at the terms, I've often used the term progressive liberal establishment, and I've often, quite naively, treated those terms progressive and liberal as interchangeable. And what we've seen very recently with Black Lives Matter and um, with, with the response to the coronavirus is that um, the, uh, the, those in the establishment, the intelligentsia who call themselves liberal, are not very liberal at all. And you, you'll see very recently, in the likes of The Guardian, the word liberal has almost disappeared. 
from the discourse. They no longer even need to pretend that they're liberal. It's all about the progressive side now, the progressive track. It's all about change. Yes. And that change, um, when you strip away the veneer, is cultural Marxism. And, and they take a, a, a viewpoint to politics. It's not about the rational arguments, the evidence or, or debate and, and compromise that we would reach in, in politics. It's all about taking a moral position and they think they are morally superior and can impose their will on other people. And all progressive movements took some moral high ground and, and spread through sort of saying there's people on the inside, which is us. We speak the correct language. We are woke. We know the correct terms. We know how to uh, navigate our way through woke politics. And then there's people on the outside who don't use such terms. And they are, they're the ones to be shamed. They're the, they're the little people who are not as sophisticated as us, not morally enlightened. They're lesser, both socially and morally. And this is how one way, important way, how it spreads. That's one of the main justifications for um, socialist movements now, or, or even communism, or in back in the, in the 1930s or 40s. The, the Nazis argued that they were morally superior. Now, of course, it's just, just the communists who would just say, well, OK, our system might not have worked. It didn't work. We, we created poverty, but it was somehow morally better because capitalism had exploitation, as if you know, their system didn't. But they, they, would, they only really argue it on, on moral ground because there's actually no real evidence. So that's one reason why the sort of, we use the term moralitis. It's people taking a position and arguing that they are somehow superior to others because they use the correct terms, whereas we don't. Um, Mark, you know, you read the, the Long mm. March. Mm. Um, uh, Neil and Robert, it's, it's, you seem to be putting pretty much at the Frankfurt School's you know, feet, this whole thing. Your, your analysis is slightly different, isn't it, in, in, in when we're talking about the Long March? Is it right? it, yeah, but I, mean, I think it, it's related. I mean, we both in, in our books talk about the Frankfurt School, and I think um, you know, this book does, does two things extremely well. The, I understand that the virus reference isn't, isn't actually uh, driven by the pandemic, but that's certainly very timely, and it helps to get the point across uh, very nicely. Uh, and, and I think it, it understands quite well where we are and, and the, the sort of craziness of the current position we've ended up in and the origins in the Frankfurt School. Um, maybe something that I um, sort of take a slightly more different tack on it is the history of how we got from there to here. I mean, there are more um, sort of direct, maybe slightly more conspiratorial than, than, than you're suggesting, but, but I, I don't think there's a direct route necessarily from the Frankfurt School to where we've ended up, but it's un unquestionably they would have been glad to see where we've ended up, and it's true that the, the direct Marxism goes away. Though, of course, it's important to say that uh, it's not very far below the surface. If you're looking at Black Lives Matter, if you're looking at Extinction Rebellion, these are both openly Marxist organizations, really. Uh, socialism, communism are, you know, waiting in the wings in Navarra Media and people like Jeremy Corbyn. So all of this cultural uh, Marxist stuff does lead back in the end to, very quickly, to people who have socialist, even communist uh, goals. So that's, um, that's worth saying. I mean, something I think is worth thinking about today that isn't, that the infection model maybe doesn't capture perfectly, I mean, every metaphor has it, its limits, is there's a lot of suppression that's going on as well. So yes, there's infection, people are picking up these ideas because they're fashionable or whatever, but also it's not that everyone agrees, it's that there are quite a lot of people who are being frightened mm. into into keeping their mouth shut or indeed into saying what they know isn't true. Yes. And it's important to understand that's yes. going on as well. Can I explain about the illness metaphor? Because I think it's very important that we've been talking about cultural Marxism and talking about it as if it's a deliberate uh, process. Um, we, we divide the moralitis into people who are contagious, so real shrill zealots, so people who are real active proselytizers for uh, cultural Marxism. They're a minority, they're a minority. Most people in society um, who are afflicted with moralitis are, are what we call carriers. So whereas the contagious super spreaders are the ones that assert their authority in the establishment and get promoted into high positions and the likes of the BBC and they get promoted in universities and our other institutions. Uh, most people, including the, most of the younger generations who don't have positions of power, they, they are carriers, they're going with the flow. And as you said, Mark, a lot of that is about fear. 
they, 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 they will just comply. But there's no doubt that if you talk to some younger people who we would class as moralitic or woke, they really have internalized a lot of these very subversive ideas. Can I, uh, it's interesting in, the, in your book here, which it, uh, there's a fair amount of wry humor, I think, in your, is that right to say I think as well? But um, you say here, super spreaders, um, they're most likely to be found in the following places. Uh, critical social sciences, William, women's studies, medical studies, black studies, student unions, campaigners for minority social justice causes, momentum in the Labour Party, teacher training institutes and teacher uni unions, the arts, the marketing industry, and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. <laughs> so uh, that brings me to you, Ray. Uh, it, this thing is discriminating, isn't it, in the sense that it doesn't affect everybody. I mean, you, we were talking about people being... Fired. Who are the people who would be the most infected with this, and do you think? Well, it's, it's most present and prevalent in our national institutions mm. and in our departments of education. I mean, that is really the core. That's the black heart of where this happens. Mm. You, may, you, you may say that the pathogen was created in, in um, the Frankfurt School, but it's schools in general, yeah. which are actually the petri dishes mm. that are breeding this. Mm. Um, as I've said recently, you know, give me a man and give me a boy till he's seven and I'll show you the man. But we now have a system whereby we have a boy from the age of zero to 18 or 21 who is being infected and exposed you know, to this viral load of moralitis. When he's not a boy anymore, and he decides um, that he's going to become someone of the gender. Exactly. Um, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, well, <laughs> does, does the virus actually promote, <laughs> you know, uh, promote ab abnormalities on that level? But I think what's happening, though, is not only is this a question of moralitis, it's a question of demoralizing as well. That's one of the after effects. You know, Yuri Bezmenov, the former uh, KGB official who was actually a teacher along with Jordan Peterson at my old university, wrote about this process by which the KGB would try to destabilize societies by demoralizing them and uh, whether this whether this whole process has been one of conspiracy or whether it's merely the, the disastrous convergence of different of different um, accidents we are in this position where they actually have taken control over these institutions and the effect is a destabilizing of society through demoralizing it and it's an effort to supplant the existing orthodoxies and the existing ideologies and the existing morality with one that's entirely foreign and the problem there, ultimately, of course, is that you weaken the national body. And once you weaken the national body, you expose it to other pathogens. And you know, when, when you have systems of mass immigration with other cultural values coming in, suddenly the existing body isn't able to defend itself against these, against these, these, these foreign interventions. And I think that's really the, the larger problem. The woke brigade may not actually win, but they may weaken the existing national body so much so that it's open to, it's open to defeat in other ways. Yes, I know. I mean, there's, a, there's certainly a big theme in my book is that the institutions that get taken over by these ideas become so obsessed with them, lose track of the things that they're actually there to do in the first place. And it's one of the terrifying things to find ourselves, you know, in the middle of this, this uh, pandemic, uh, dealing with the virus. In, in, and all of our national institutions seem to be not very good at their jobs, but very good at, you know, all the um, moralitic, as you say, um, things worrying about those, but not actually the things that they should be doing. I think uh, actually the, the British state has been exposed as being alarmingly weak, isn't it? I mean, when I say weak, weakened, you know, as you say, in all of its responses, it seems entirely incompetent now. I mean, I, what I wanted to ask earlier was, uh, we're, with this is that you were talking about, you know, how the body becomes weakened, if you're talking about the, the society, the country. Um, isn't half of the problem the lack of resistance from people who should be resisting? I mean, I your Conservative Party, for example. Well, we, we, absolutely, but weakening the, the body politic, we, weakening the, the society, making it more vulnerable to other infections. Of course, one of the main implications, one of the main uh, symptoms of movilitis is, of course, uh, a failure to, or lack of, end, turn the nation state into, into the enemy that you want to undermine, the institution that has nurtured freedom in this country, the most inclusive identity, the nation state is being undermined and they open, they support mass immigration and ultimately that could really be the, the death knell of wokeism, not through people resisting it from, uh, from within the UK, but really replacing in a sense uh, that by inviting in more people from developing nations who come from cultures who are distinctly 
conservative, very, very strictly conservative. And this gives a sort of a, a change, because they will believe that immigrants would be there as agents of some kind of revolutionary change. They may find that it would be actually a very different revolution if indeed there were to be completely open borders, which of course don't actually exist in the UK at the moment. There, is, you know, there isn't complete open free immigration, neither, neither is there in Sweden. But of course the balance is changing and so there is going to be a cultural shift and it's going to be very different to what the, what the woke brigade, as it were, have, in, have, in, have imagined. You can draw sort of parallel slightly with the Iranian Revolution, right, where you had this alliance between the left-leaning students and the right-wing ayatollahs um, to overthrow and topple the Shah's regime, and the idea, and the, the students were ex expecting this new Valhalla to be ushered in by it, but of course they were the first ones to be strung up. Another way around looking at that, and the assumption is that the new groups, socially conservative, religious perhaps, uh, will you know be very very strange bedfellows and, 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 and the woke are going to get a shot. Well what about if the woke turn around and actually adapt those cultures? I mean the novelist uh, Michel Huelbeck uh, in his uh, a recent yeah. book yeah. talked exactly about mm. that that in fact you know these liberal academics at the Sorbonne, uh, this was in submission sorry, uh, actually they, they convert to Islam and it's great. He's got uh, two or three brides. Yeah. He's got all the rest mm. of it. Come on. You can see that yeah. happening, can't you? Uh, well, mo mo I'm, I'm not sure that I can well, see that happening, except in you know what is, I admit, a, a very good novel. But but it seems to me that what, what's much more likely is that well, I mean, we're talking about immigration. We're still talking about relatively small numbers, and we're talking about numbers that go into very tight communities and and, and self segregate. Um, so that's really what happens. I think is that is that it becomes separated. And the important thing is that these intellectual networks, the universities and the schools, um, you know, impart those values to new generations. And that, I think, is, is much more powerful and resistant to, you know, other cultural forces that, that might be around, partly because people, the young, the new generation, start to learn what they should say if they want to get on, if they want girlfriends, boyfriends, jobs. Um, all, all the rest of it. So that, that I think, is an extremely well, it, powerful force. Well, it's um, this is where we sort of can come back on to the, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Some people are particularly vulnerable to moralitis because they are either a on the make or b they just want to get on or of course c they find that they will adapt to the most intolerant ideology. It gives to be uh, woke is to have a great deal of power over other people because you can shut them down in an instant. You can just say, I disagree with what you're saying. You are racist, you are transphobic, you are any other you know, name that could be associated with a mental illness. It gives a great deal of power to people. And, and really, it's those who are authoritarian in their nature will adopt moralitis because, and the, and the symptoms that come with it because it gives them the opportunity to impose their will on other people. So it's not that... These, these are the same people who, in other circumstances, would have been backing the Nazis or would have been backing state communism in Eastern Europe because it gave them an opportunity mm. to lord it over other people and they thought they were morally superior and progressive. And to do that, you need mm. to have a, a mindset that uh, you only see moral absolutes and that there is only right and wrong and that you are somehow morally superior and should be respected, should receive the benefits of your moral superiority and your social superiority and have the opportunity to lord it over other people. In which case, if there is just a new intolerant ideology that comes along, they will adopt that. It's just, this is, just happens to be, moralitis just happens to be the most intolerant ideology of our age. And that's why people are jumping onto it. And, and sugared and, over the top, yeah. of course. And, 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 and as soon as another intolerant these ideology are, yeah, yeah, comes, and if the state yeah. ideology changes, they will move yeah. as quickly. But as I think we should be careful about saying they. I mean, the reason it works so much is it's us. You know? I mean, I it's part of human uh, nature, yes. Being human is that. You mm. know, it's, it's the, mob, the mob psychology. And Jordan Peterson is very good on this. I think you, know, you should always think about you know, the Nazis and think to yourself, I would have been a member of the Nazi party. Maybe I wouldn't have been you know, out there in the front, but I probably would have been because most people were. You know, that's, that's how it goes. Jesus Christ was you know, crucified by his people. That, that's how people are. So these intolerant ideologies are precisely so dangerous. Mm because there's something in you, me, everyone around this table even, who are, there's something seductive there that can get to us.
or even if you just want to get on, if you want to navigate mm. your way through school and university and come out with a good grade and then get a job now in the City of London in financial services or a law firm, you're going to have to be parroting these lines. You're going to be have to go into uh, diversity training. You're going to be have to be be um, saying the, the official sort of state ideology, you're going to, have to be talking about your unconscious bias and, and apologising endlessly for your white privilege or um, whatever privilege you, you, you believe that you have um, as a way of advancing through the system. And that's really one of the key aspects. So some people in Eastern Europe supported communism, not because they were really deep down communist, it's because they just wanted to progress. They wanted what was best for their families. They wanted to have the opportunity to have a better life. And to, uh, to do that, they had to have their party card and they had to show and feign their support. And uh, you know, if we're going to sort of, you mentioned, you mentioned Jesus Christ, but you know, in, in there, the, uh, in, in the Bible, in you know, Jesus sort of speaks about uh, the, the hypocrites and people who would be praying in public and how awful that was. This is exactly the same phenomenon as people showing that they have some moral superiority over others, all as a way of advancing themselves and advancing their position in society and, at the end of the day, their own economic clout as well. But Peter, you ask where is the Conservative Party in all of this, and I think that is the, one of the greatest tragedies of COVID, was the fact that you had a party with a, with a huge amount of public support, a huge majority, and really had the opportunity to effect real change here. And unfortunately, COVID arrived out of the blue. I mean, you know, expect the unexpected, and um, completely um, sideswiped the government. Uh, a very nim a government that was really very nimble. It was really much like a cabinet government in name only. It was really, you know, we know Dominic Cummings is the real power behind the force. Boris Johnson is, 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 is not really a conservative socially in, in any way whatsoever, but Dominic Cummings had his ear to the ground. He knew full well that the Tory party would be facing an existential crisis if it wasn't able to actually connect with the socially conservative red wall of the past. Uh, for, and, you know, just as Tony Blair started a 10-year revolution from 1997, this was supposed to be, really, ideally, the 10 years with which you could have actually had a real attempt to, to combat this, this rise of wokery, and yet we're seeing so much support for the Tory party hemorrhaging now that you wonder whether they actually will have a full 10 years to actually try to ins institute. There's some positive things we've seen really with the civil service um, and with the BBC being restructured, and that needs to go across all, the, all of the quangos, the public institutions, teacher training colleges need to be restructured, universities need to be given full warnings on this, cancel culture needs to be declared war on, and you know, just as Trump gave that terrific speech that he did on July the 4th in front of Mount Rushmore, well, the best speech of his entire presidency, standing up for American values and for traditional values and for common sense and reason, this is an opportunity we have here to do exactly the same sort of thing, and leadership is sorely lacking. Well, and not only lacking, but, but I mean, remarkably illiberal in the, in the approach to, well, to COVID, first of all, and, and to other things like lifestyle values as well. You know, well, Boris Johnson becoming, going from being someone who's anti-nanny state to, you know, bring on the nanny state to, to, to slim us all down. Well, the, the Conservative Party surrendered and went over to the other side in the culture war in the, uh, in the, early, in the early noughties, you know, for nearly 20 years oh, now. Oh, i say earlier than that. Uh, well, of course, of course, um, un, un, under Thatcher, there was a, a failure to realise that the, the long march through the institutions was underway, and just thought that freeing up the market and making it, trying to make civil servants uh, act in, in a way that mimicked the private sector was enough. Of course, it was, a, it was a complete failure because it failed to realise the enemy that was working away and rotting at the system. But then, in the Conservative Party itself, and some very prominent people in the Conservative Party at the top of our government today had embraced cultural Marxism. The book A Blue Tomorrow, which was published shortly after the 2001 general election, lauded Gramsci, spoke about that in a, in a justification for the, the conservative, recent Conservative policy that was praising FDR. Again, there was this uh, idolising of Gramsci and, and thought that if we had to play this game, and instead of looking at uh, issues which affect ordinary people, uh, the voters, the things that really matter, such as the economy or education, there was this navel gazing and this, this belief that they had to in, go down the path of identity politics. And so for much of the Conservative Party, they're almost sort of being hoist by their own petard, because if you play the other side's game, they win, because they're the ones that are setting the rules. So the Conservative Party did, as you mentioned, Rafe, to have this great opportunity to break down the red wall and embrace social conservatism and put something back into uh, our society, rebuild our society, but it already given 
up too much to the the identitarians who who want to spread division. There used to be so much sort of talk. We all have to be more inclusive in the Conservative Party, and we have to. It was all. I mean, it was all just a self criticism. We had even the person who criticised Conservatives who gave the term, invented the term the nasty party, which was used against us for years, they even elected that woman as leader. That's how bad the situation was. Thankfully, they, you know, she was shown that she wasn't really up to the job, which I'm sure she would agree with now. But the Conservative Party really does have to be uh, the party that's going to be rebuilding our society. And, and instead of, it has to move away from this this belief that they need to play the other side's game. Well, I think I think that uh, I would say cause we've discussed this thing on the show for. Uh, I think they just many of them still don't quite understand it. I just think that they haven't just you know basically surrendered. Quite often they, you know, how many times in the arts have you had? Oh well, you know, arty, you know, art. There are arty types. They tend to be left. You know, uh, no. This is this is a different order that we're talking about here. A different order entirely. Um, Rafe was talking about uh, what needed to be done and how it might not be done now. Uh, you actually have specific ideas in this in this book, which are a lot dissimilar. But I mean, I, it's interesting because I mean they they will resonate with people. Uh, you talk about um, Neil uh, the promotion of plain speak. You know, um, how how would you promote plain speak, and or you know what would you what would you give us an example? Of? Speak. We, we make the point, the general point about remedies, how we reverse this march through the institutions, how we, how we re remedy this, this illness, uh, is about, the first thing is awareness. So the patient has to know that they're ill, yeah, and the doctor has to know that there's a, a disease to be treated. So we have to have awareness that something has gone very badly wrong, and language is of course so powerful to cultural Marxists, you know, control the language, you control the debate. And, and we use, so I'm not sure it's the best example, but something I was thinking about on the way here today was this term political correctness. So I've always um, eschewed that term. I've never liked it because it, it, it's, it actually does, it's actually a communist term, isn't it? That's where it comes from. But the, most people don't know that. And most people use the word as something which is, oh, it's a bit of a burden, you have to watch how you say things and all that. But it sounds like it's actually a good thing, really. Political correctness. Mm. And- Well-meaning. Uh, well yes, meaning. indeed, yeah. indeed. And, and it, 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 it's like a, 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 a euphemism, which um, people, even if they're sort of mildly criticizing it, they think that, um, you know, underlyingly it's a good thing. And, and I think that we need to get away from these um, terms that are like masking the wolf in sheep's clothing. And I think it's a good thing that we are now using the term woke, because what has happened to woke? Five years ago, people were calling themselves woke on the left as a good thing. Now they know it's been discredited. Hardly anyone is using that term. But, but the thing is, I, I'd agree with that. But the, the problem is, I think it's exactly the same with political correctness. Very mm. few people would call themselves, "Oh, I'm I'm politically correct and proud." I mean, the point is, you know, they become terms of humour yes. and abuse, but they are still so powerful that everyone abides by them. Yes, but I think there is. They laugh. Laugh, laughter mm. is useful, though. You know, laughter is a, it's, a, it's a good sort of um, way of clearing the air. I mean, the, the, the cover of the book has the, the NPC uh, meme on it, which was extremely successful on the internet. Uh, the idea of um, people who have adopted this ideology becoming non player characters in a computer game who don't have any mind themselves. Uh, this is a very harsh criticism, but very funny and, and, and got some traction precisely because of what it spoke to, what people were giving up to be part of the ideology. Um, and and that, that does carry some weight to Tiny and McGrath uh, mm. on Twitter. But I, I grant you, it, it, it's not the complete solution. I mean, I, I think um, th there probably are things, it doesn't seem like he's going to do any of them. There are things that Boris Johnson could do. But uh, I, I mean, one that struck me uh, in there, there was another one that was something to do with, you know, using the power of the state to control some of the, um, the sort of ideological spread within the civil service and places like that. Now, Donald Trump in America just a, a few days ago, maybe a week ago, has said, it's more as a gesture, but it, it does lay down a marker, has said, 
federal uh, workers can't be trained into critical race theory uh, and against sort of unconscious bias uh, in, in federal agencies. That, that seems like a good marker to sort of use the bully pulpit of the state to, to stop that sort of thing from happening. Uh, but I, I sincerely doubt that's going to happen. Ch Charles Moore wrote a, an article in The Telegraph saying the civil service has become uh, you know, completely infected with woke um, civil service, you know, critical theorists who are just obsessed by race. And we've actually got a, got a questionnaire in the book to, to spot these people. And uh, we need to, you know, to, so they can, we can identify who has been infected and who's... Uh, who, who's sort of adopted this this, this ideology? Who's got, who's got moralitis? So of course we can then look at perhaps appointing them into uh, into another, another career because this is a, the, they believe that anything from the Conservative Party is bad. Uh, anything anything that's part of the existing structures, anything that's a great institution, the Conservative Party goes back hundreds of years. Uh, that must in its in its history. So therefore that must be done away with and the civil service will stymie everything from this government, water it down and wreck it uh, at every opportunity purely for the sake of doing that. So we really do need to reform the civil service and if the government needs to be very much on top of this, I know the will is there but uh, they need to adopt uh, our questionnaire just to identify who are the ones that are infected. Because this week alone you've had, whilst you've had Trump speaking out against critical race theory, you've had in, in the British Parliament £4,000 being spent on unconscious bias training. And as someone pointed out, what is the point of having an 80-seat majority if you can't yeah. actually stop this mm, happening yes. within your own workplace? Mm, I think uh, one, you talking about uh, speech again, Neil, there, I think one, you can sort of turn it on its head and say you can actually identify these people by some of the words they use. Yes. So, for example, yes. the word, you, you know, you were talking about political correctness being communist in, in origin, but, you know, the word problematic mm. is always used now. Something is problematic. They don't actually say this is wrong or we're going to give it. This is problematic. Mm. This is concerning. You know, these sorts of words, which sound very sort of, they sound almost mild, but oh. that, that is a way of spotting. Like inappropriate question. is another one. Yes, inappropriate. That's an old, old, old favourite. Um, mm. What's interesting as well in your book, I, I found actually one of the most interesting parts was that in the, at the end you go into great depth into the armed forces, mm. actually. Mm. And I, I think, you know, I looked at it and thought, well, you, you know, that's worth another book, actually. But mm. I've always sort of tended to hope that that is the one area uh, where basically, you know, things haven't basically been invaded. Mm. But it's not the case, is it? No, it was a case that the the police have have, have fallen. Now the now you, the police are, you know, they're essentially they're the militant wing of the Guardian newspaper. And as they become more and more in woke, they become more and more intolerant and more and more militarised. And the police forces uh, that are in in regimes such as Scotland, which are the most woke, they're the most uh, can be the most vicious police forces, and they literally arrest more than three thousand people each year for things they've put out, electronic communications, that the, that the state doesn't, you know, deems uh, in, inappropriate or problematic. Uh, and the armed forces is also now going through this whole process. The fire brigade, well, that fell long ago. You know, their standards, you know, they've got lower standards now for um, women and, and, and people you know, uh, of, of different uh, eth ethnicities to become a fire, fire well, they used to be called a fireman. Uh, the armed forces is now falling. There's something called the Wigston report into inappropriate behaviours where they look at spotting people who may be right wing and uh, may be uh, uh, one of, the, one of the, the signs that they have to cramp, clamp down on is in the people who are patriotic. They've got to watch out for patriotic people and working, working class young men who may have traditional values. They are now, in a sense, you know, public enemy number one in the armed forces and uh, their behaviour is being firmly watched. So what would you... If you know, this is top brass stuff. So, isn't it basically the same as what's been happening in the church? You know, well, it's it not really top brass stuff because the the army top brass know that this is wrong because the army top brass, as you said, they've got fighting experience. They know exactly what's required. You need to have the very best physical specimens of the nation fighting forces. But you've got management consultants coming in, you've got these non-military appointments being brought in to shape up the army as if it's any other institution. The army is not any other institution. It's a very unique set of skills you have to have if you're actually going to be prepared to kill another person. And um, the, the idea that you can simply just um, in, introduce a whole, you know, 
regulations about inappropriate behaviour when the behaviour of the army is by instinct inappropriate by our domestic civil standards, but they're in situations which require inappropriate actions by our standards. But the army top brass understand this full well, and the army top brass have spoken out against the fact that women have lower physical requirements when clearly they're not up to the task required for those, for those frontline positions. But, I mean, something I talk about in my book is, is that not just in the army, but in all of these institutions, really a large part of the problem, I think, has been the growth of managerialism, as you say, management consultants, but it, it's, it's often people who are employed directly as well. Because the problem is that precisely takes all these institutions, which, you know, the NHS, the church, whatever, they all have their own distinctive professional cultures, the things that they're there to do, the police. And then it says, no, 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 there are these universal managerial approaches and we're going to bring in ideas from elsewhere and it'll be the same ideas in every place and we'll take away your distinctive culture and your distinctive goals and we'll replace it with these universal, apparently anodyne, apparently very neutral managerial virtues. And that's how every single institution becomes lousy at its job and becomes taken over by the same ideas. And it's very difficult to fight against. And, um, you know, the military... Um, perhaps seemed better at holding its own because it has such a very distinctive culture, but uh, we it shall see, it's not, not good news. It's interesting that the, the, when they, the, the army took on the, uh, they had various different attempts at advertising campaigns, isn't it? And there was one which was just, you know, caused uproar because it showed, I think, a, a soldier stopping to pray, a Muslim soldier stopping to pray in the middle of a battlefield. And, and, you know, and this was sort of, just you know so completely unrealistic and the other soldiers uh, don't, are told not to answer the radio not while to answer the radio while he's doing all of this yeah. and it, oh dear, they, they stop their mission yeah. yes it's but the one that uh, they, they followed that with um one which was aimed fair and square at the woke younger generation if you remember do you remember this it was like aimed at soy boys and people like that and softy uh, do you know the one i mean that was a huge success for them it was a huge success. How do you account for that? Isn't that well, this is one of the reasons why companies as well um, end up being taken over by these ideas. It comes in through the HR departments, and it's partly because the HR departments are less connected to you know, the pro professional goals and ideals of these companies. Uh, but it's also because they want to recruit young people, and the universities are you know, very strong breeding grounds of these ideas. So in order to recruit, they feel that they have to... Um, celebrate these ideas to bring in to bring in the new generation of workers so, so that that doesn't help but what happened to celebrating people uh, uh, giving them an opportunity to better themselves to excel to be aspirational to to see the world to have an attractive uniform to to be fitter and stronger than other people which is attractive to the opposite sex and what about celebrating those things the army did recruited on proven biological reasons that, that young men are interested in uh, that, uh, and that something a, a working class lad from Luton can aspire to be something better and serve his nation uh, rather than a woke ideology in a structured environment that will give him discipline and something that, that, that he needs. That would be a greater social benefit. Uh, it would be a stabilising force in this country. It would give people something to believe in and then they would have the opportunity to go back into their communities and be proud and strong and upstanding members of society as we would expect you know, most soldiers uh, to be. That, that would be a lot better rather than giving in to the, this woke ideology. And I think, um, Mark, you make, make a, 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 the point there that employers believe that they have to get all their recruits from university and I think that's got to change, one of the things that's got to change. And I think that increasing numbers of employers are realising that people who have gone to university are not um, three years better than the people that haven't. In fact, in many ways, they're three years worse because these universities, and I'm not just talking about um, um, the former polytechnics here, I'm talking about Russell Group universities, are acting these days like madrasas. I mean, it doesn't matter what course you do at, um, a, at a university, it could be a STEM subject, you'll still get all this unconscious bias stuff. The whole culture, it's pervasive, all this woke ideology for any student, whatever um, they're studying. So I, I think if I were an employer, I'd be thinking, rather than do psychometric tests to weed out people with um, supposed far-right views, as you mentioned, Robert, for the army. Patriotism be being far-right, yeah. Psychometric tests to weed out the woke. 
because they're going to come in and cause trouble. The last thing we want to do is have a, a, an, an army out there of woke uh, armed soldiers which are deeply politicised, see things, they're not there to obey orders, they're to, like the <laughs> they're, 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 they're there to impose their will on other people. But, yeah. mm, but even in a small business, in fact maybe it's even more important in a small business where you've got a good team that harmoniously work together and, and could be actually very diverse, but you bring in someone who is full of this woke ideology, mm. they can cause a lot of difficulty. Oh yes, yes. No, definitely. And, and one of the distinctive things about it, I think, is, is the moral authority that the people who are instructing that way feel at a very young age yes. and, and the, the need that older people who should you know, have more authority feel to defer to them. Mm, yeah. It's the power of the young, which is it's quite like the Cultural Revolution and Mao and you know, struggle sessions of uh, young students, uh, red guards over old people. It does feel a bit like, I mean, it astonishes me slightly mm. That, that very powerful people will now defer to the young woke. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why they still have that, that authority over, over the, the old, but they do seem to. Just for, briefly to, to round off, uh, however this situation came, you know, whether it was a, you know, absolutely pure long march, whether it was more random, however, what we've ended up with now, um, and it causes people utter bewilderment and, and despair, I would say, actually. Uh, how long have we got to change it? Seriously, how long? You know, you know, w are we talking generations, or how long have we actually got before the rot is too deep? Well, I've said already, in the next 10 years, as far as I'm concerned, is the time to do it, because uh, <laughs> those people under 25 at the last election, if they had been the only ones to vote, there would have been something like an 80% uh, majority for the Labour Party. Nobody in the um, in the that age group has any interest in the Conservative Party because they've been through this education system where they're taught that Toryism is evil and that Tories have no compassion and so forth. And if that's not addressed by the Tory Party, whose 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 voting base is getting older and older, there, there will be an existential crisis for the party and and for the country. And so it is a very short period of time. And I agree with you entirely about the university system. I mean, people often assume that. Brexiteers don't have a university education, meaning therefore that they're less educated. But I think very much so is the case that those people who went to university have been through this madrasa system and have been exposed to these ideologies and have become dimmer as a result of that. And so, yeah, it's a very short period of time and it has to be a focus primarily on the educational system restructuring or getting rid of teacher training colleges completely and having a different way to, to train teachers who aren't exposed to these to these ideologies or, de or de 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 the uh, post postmodernists and post-structuralists. And then at the university system, simply ceasing to fund all of these grievance studies courses so that people aren't exposed to these theories which have absolutely no basis in science whatsoever. And any universities that in embrace cancel culture, their funding is, is, is ended too. And that the government should actually re reward or protect those who are cancelled by giving them other appointments. There needs to be a real proactive stance taken on this because if you don't actually have an aggressive stance rather than merely a defensive one, there's no chance at this stage in the game. That's why we sort of you like the virus analogy because we believe the government needs to treat this as a public health emergency. Uh, we need to. We've got outlines how this can be how can be tackled. It's it's a mental malady. It's also affecting genuinely affecting people's mental health uh, when they become uh, they, get, they get the symptoms of marvelitis. It can really damage people. So we actually actually helping people as well as saving our, our society from, from people who are there to wreck it and have put this virus out there to wreck our sort of civilization. I do actually believe we are winning the culture war uh, of course, they, the other side started it to try and ruin culture, to have this year zero, which you spoke of, this, uh, Mark, the, 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 and the Red Guard analogy, which is you know, completely very fitting. Uh, just, they've just changed the colours of their, of their uniforms in, in many instances. What we, what we have is, uh, is they, they've unleashed this culture war, but to win it, you know, which we are, we do need to fight back. We need to seize the commanding heights. We need to, as, as Rafe showed, uh, we need to sort of show there is an opportunity. People can get on in society if they're not woke. And indeed, actually, if they're free thinking, they have diversity of opinion, they have an open mind, as people who aren't infected with marvelitis have, then there is opportunity for them. And people will quickly 
move, they will quickly change their, their, their position once they see that there is another way and that the intolerance of movilitis isn't the only way to uh, move up in, in society. But I think we are winning the culture war and that sort of sh you can sort of see signs of this on the, the internet where uh, there will be sort of certain woke um, shows or videos which will be ridiculed. Uh, Gary Lineker's uh, argument that uh, because there's fish and chips we should have unlimited uh, immigration into into the UK that received about you know a handful of likes and literally thousands of dislikes. You know people are, most people are commonsensical and realize this is uh, uh, the, the, this, this is an absurd situation we've got ourselves in and but we really have to stand up otherwise that the minority, because in any system, the, the Bolsheviks in, in Russia were only a small minority, but they got the commanding heights and imposed their will. The genuine Nazis were probably only ever no more than 15% of the population in Germany and Austria. Uh, radical Islamists are still probably a minority within Muslim countries, but m aggressive uh, extremists such as the woke or, or, or these other movements can achieve power and impose their will if the 80% who uh, just let it happen and the 80% is very relevant. George Orwell in 1984, Winston Smith was pleading if only the 80% would stand up to the party we would be free of this and so I think we are winning but we've got to fight back and we have to seize the commanding heights and we have to say no more and we have we can put a stop to this and hopefully through that there'll be rationality returned to our country again i think uh, i i increasingly feel it's a question of taking away the money uh you know like you say about universities uh essentially whether it's your bbc license w w you know whether it's the arts council if you know or even corporations you know to stop buying Ben and Jerry's or whatever? I mean, I, I think, I, I didn't think I'd be the most pessimistic person in the room, but in a way I am. I, I think this talk about winning the culture war is just, I don't see it. The culture war is lost. They own the commanding heights. They own every single institution. They are not a large number of people, but they're a small number of people in control of all the major elite networks, all the intellectual networks. And we all have to swim in that world. And it'll be like that for a while now, I think you say in the book, you know, it's going to get worse uh, uh, before, well, I, before I, it gets better. Now, I, I do think it, it, I do think it'll work out in the end, but I actually see it as a much longer project. You've got to come up with ideas. The, the Frankfurt School, these, these awful ideas took a very long time to work their way through. The free market ideas of Margaret Thatcher, it was a 50 year project or so to bring those through. We need that again. Brexit we need, took us decades. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Brexit, exactly yeah. the same thing. So, you know. Liberty, common sense, these things, we need new arguments for these in the way that we needed new arguments for the sort of free trade liberalism of the 19th century for the 20th century. And that is a generational project and that's going to take decades. Uh, but mm. the short term, it's going to well, be rough. I mean, I, I, I share Robert's optimism and it's an optimism which kind of goes at odds with what a lot of commentators like yourself, Mark, think. I mean, working in a university, I could see some green shoots coming through, very small number, and they don't get enough support. Um, but what I see happening now, this year, is some dramatic developments. So coronavirus was not a cultural Marxist movement, but the response to the coronavirus pandemic has been a boon to cultural Marxism. And alongside the coronavirus pandemic, We've had the Black Lives Matter um, movement, and we've had also the Extinction Rebellion um, um, trying to um, make the most of this, this um, weakness at the moment as well. But inevitably, they are, have pushed far too far. And at the moment, they think that their, um, their, that their um, cause is, is being um, advanced by what's going on at the moment. It isn't, and I think that young people, partly for economic reasons, because there's a massive carnage that's going to come about through the coronavirus um, res response, I think younger people are going to realise that their future is not with woke ideologues who want to shut the universities down, want to shut the schools down, want to shut the government down, want to smash down the statues. Younger people will see that these are not the priorities 
these, this is not a bright future for them. Woke ideology is very dark and they'll begin to see the light. Plus, well, plus, um, very, very much hope so. plus, society naturally produces mm. antibodies, people who object to the status quo. And these people who uh, have differing ideas to the established order are often, because they're free thinking, often mm. uh, very uh, magnetic personalities that people are drawn to. And these antibodies are the natural uh, parts of society, these contrarians, mm. can really take many people with them. Uh, so, really, uh, there is a sort of natural defence mechanism within the, the body politic, as it were. I think that the, 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 the interesting thing about the movements we're talking about and the trend is they are apparently totally leaderless. There is something about that. There are no charismatic leaders. It, they, it, they don't seem to need this, which shows you the strength they have in the institutions. There are no... Are there anybody... Is there anybody that you can point to and say, that's the famous that, that and that? There's not. So it's interesting. But listen, gentlemen, that, that's it, I think, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, thank you very, very much for coming in. Thank you, Robert, Neil, Mark, and Rafe. Um, and um, we will be discussing this again, I can guarantee it, maybe two or three times more this year, you know, if not more. We'll probably make a series out of it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, I must ask you too, as well, just to have a look at our new campaign site saveourstatues.org.uk. Uh, we've had a great response to it so far in terms of subscription and people donating. Uh, so please join them, won't you? And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. <laughs>